good afternoon to everyone so this course is about the measurement techniques in multi phase flows now i am uh, we are going to discuss in this course about the different techniques used to measure the flow behavior of multi phase flow reactors before that my brief introduction i am rajesh kumar upadhyay associate professor in department of chemical engineering iit guwahati and my main your research area is on multi phase flow reactor diagnosis and i am working on the different techniques uh, and trying to implement those techniques to investigate the flow physics in multi phase flow reactors now coming back to the course uh, as i said that the course has actually two things one is the measurement techniques and about the multi phase flow reactors uh, i would expect that you should have a brief idea about the multi phase flow reactors but still to bring everyone in the same platform initially what i will do i will introduce about the multi phase flow reactors and different terminology used to analyze the multi phase flow reactors and then i'm going to divide the whole course in the following content so first week we are going to discuss about the multi phase flow reactors and multi phase flow measurement techniques so here in this week i am going to tell mainly about the different uh, terminology used to define the multi phase flow then what are the multi phase flow techniques invasive and i am going to divide that multi phase flow techniques in two parts one is invasive and another one is non invasive and we'll discuss what is invasive and non invasive techniques so this is the basics where we are going to bring everyone on the same platform i'm going to tell you about the basics definitions and all then in the next week what we are going to do we are going to again take the invasive techniques and invasive techniques again actually we'll divide into part velocity measurement technique and volume fraction measurement techniques now what are these two we will discuss in the first week at all that what is volume fraction and what is the velocity measurement and when i say vol volume fraction measurement or velocity measurement what do i mean so under this uh, in this week what we are going to do we are going to cover mainly four techniques one is pitot tube then pressure probe hot wire anemometry and optical fiber probe so we'll discuss about the principle of these techniques advantages disadvantages and uh, limitations if any then in the next week uh, i am going to focus on the non invasive technique and actually i am going to take two weeks to cover the non invasive techniques because this is the technique which is widely used in the modern era and particularly if one is interested in the higher studies or research this is a technique which are widely used to diagnose the multi phase flow reactors now so i am going to spend two weeks on this that's why and the first week what i will do i will take the non invasive uh, techniques and we'll discuss about the non invasive technique which is used for velocity measurements so here i will discuss the mainly again four techniques one is the laser doppler anemometry particle image velocimetry positron emission particle tracking and radioactive particle tracking technique and i would spend more time on the radioactive particle tracking technique here then next week uh, what we are going to do uh, we are going to take the non invasive technique only for for volume fraction measurements so here what i am going to do that how to measure the volume fraction in multi phase flow reactors by using the non invasive measurement techniques and again i am going to discuss the four techniques mainly is electrical capacitance tomography computed tomography while discussing the computed tomography i would also introduce something about the x ray tomography and we'll see that why i haven't put it in the same topic Uh, as a, uh, as a different topic then i am going to discuss about the magnetic resonance imaging and ultrasonic methods which are used for medical as well as now is being popular to use for the chemical reaction engineering uh, reaction engineering or reactor engineering also so this will be the overall course plan and with this course plan uh, we will start our course and i will try to put a assignment uh, for each section and we can discuss whenever it is needed you can drop me up uh, your questions and we'll try to answer whatever the queries we have you have so let's begin the course and as i said that i am first going to introduce about the multi phase flow that what is multi phase flow now it's not like that measurement techniques are required only in the multi phase flow measurement techniques are required even for the single phase flow and since the generation of the fluid mechanics i can say or any transport processes the measurement becomes a integral part of that so why it is important because if i want to understand about any system i need to measure the flow behavior or the process conditions of the system so let's take a very simple example suppose i have there is a fluid which is flowing in a pipeline and i want to measure that what is the behavior of the flow so how we characterize the behavior of the flow in single phase we say that 
if I want to find it out the flow behavior, we want to calculate a number called Reynolds number. I hope everyone knows what is Reynolds number, but to introduce that Reynolds number, Reynolds number is 0 d upon mu. So, this Reynolds number is a dimensional list number and so Reynolds number R e is equal to V rho d upon mu. Now, let us see that I know that what is the fluid which is flowing inside the pipe and I know the diameter of the pipe. So, if I know the diameter of the pipe actually I know this, if I know the fluid then I know both rho and mu of the fluid, but what I do not know is, is the velocity. So, what I need to do? I need to measure the velocity of the fluid in the pipeline and if I is able to measure the velocity of the fluid in the pipeline, I will able to calculate the Reynolds number. And if I am able to calculate the Reynolds number, I will able to say that if Reynolds number is less than 2100, my flow is laminar. And if Reynolds number is greater than 4200, my flow is turbulent. And in between, if I have something, I am in the transition regime. So, even if I want to characterize a fluid flow, a single phase fluid flow in a pipeline, I need a measurement which is called velocity. So, I need a velocity measurement and based on that I can calculate the Reynolds number. So, since the origin of all this transport processes, not only in the fluid mechanics, I have taken a typical example of the fluid mechanics, but even if it is a heat transfer, I need to measure the temperature to find it out that for how much heat flux will be transferring by using the Fourier's law. Similarly, in the mass transfer, I need to measure the concentration. So, any transport processes you think about, if I want to understand about that transport process, I need to measure something, some variable to define my transport processes and to define the behavior of that transport processes. So, multiphase flow reactors are no different in that also we have to measure something to find if we want to classify the uh, uh, diagnosis the multiphase flow reactor or understand the multiphase flow reactors or vessels we need to measure some parameters to understand that. Now, before going to that measurement part I would like to first discuss is that that what I need to measure. So, to do that before that I would like to introduce about the multiphase flow that what is multiphase flow. So, there is some confusion in the multiphase flow always and people generally believe that once I say multiphase it means the state. So, actually multiphase flow means the flow of either two different or two or more different states which are flowing together like gas, liquid or solid these are the three states we know. So, if the flow of the two different states are taking place that is obviously uh, so multiphase flow reactors. It can also be defined that if the two species which are uh, same in the phase wise, their state wise they are same like liquid, uh, the state wise either they are liquid or they are gas, but if their chemical properties are different, they will still be considered as a multiphase flow. So, multiphase flow reactors broadly or formally can be defined as the simultaneously flow of materials which with having a different states or having a different chemical properties. Now, once I say that state is different, it means one phase can be in gas, one phase can be in liquid and one phase can be in solid. So, or a combination of all three. So, like if suppose if I talk about a typical distillation column. So, what happened? There is a two phases available. One phase is in the vapor inside the distillation column and one phase can be in liquid. So, what happened? In each tray, if you think about the tray, there are some liquid hold up on the tray. And so, if I think about the each tray, what happened? There are some liquid hold up inside the tray and vapor of the another phase or the same phase is actually passed through this tray. So, what happened? They form a small bubbles and then they go to the next tray. So, if you think about the each tray on the distillation column, it is a flow of a gas and liquid system and that is becomes a multiphase flow reactors and or multiphase flow contactors and the behavior of the distillation column we all know that is going to depend on the plate efficiency and plate efficiency is going to depend on the interaction between the liquid and this bubbles okay, that or vapor bubbles which is passing through this. So, that is we can make the multiphase flow systems very complicated and interesting because there are different states are involved and the behavior of the multiphase flow reactors or performance of the multiphase flow reactors or contractors depends on the interaction how these two phases are being interacted. Similarly, we can if the two similar phases uh, similar states are moving together, 
they can still be a multi phase flow like a uh, typical example is oil water flow in any petroleum industry. So, oil and water both are in the same states both are in the liquid phase, but still if they are flowing together there can be a multi phase. So, what happens that if the oil and gas flow together then depending upon the properties the oil can be in continuous and we can see the droplet of the water. So, this is oil which is in continuous and we can see the droplet of water. So, once the water is being in the suspended phase or in dispersed phase in the oil or oil is in the dispersed phase in the water depending again on the properties I am telling then again the same thing that if suppose this is oil phase and this is the water continuous. So, this can be oil and this can be water. So, depending on their property the oil can disperse in water or water can disperse in oil both are in the same state in the liquid phase, but still this is a typical multi phase flow example. Even for the matter of the fact if suppose both are in the they both are not dispersed and they are separated with a layer. So, suppose this bottom part is water because of having higher density and top part is oil because of having lower density if they are flowing together they are still considered as a multi phase flow because of the interface they are going to interact with each other. So, the multi phase flow I hope it might be clear now that the multi phase flow is the simultaneous flow of either two different states or same state, but their chemical properties should be different. So, these are classified as a multi phase flow. Now, multi phase flow can take place in reactors can be in contactors actually if you go and analyze any industry this multi phase flow can, see, can be considered as heart of any industry. So, you think about any contactors which you have uh, studied in your undergraduate studies or you think about most of the reactors you will see that everywhere there is a multi phase. Now, what is the region that multi phase flow is being used so widely? Now, if I come to the reactor purpose I will just take you back to the basic CRE courses chemical reaction engineering courses which you have done is that we say that to increase the reaction rate what I need to do there is two kind of resistance one is mass transfer resistance one is kinetic resistance. Now, most of the time even if I have a very good kinetic I am not able to do the reaction at that rate which is desired and that is mainly region is about the surface area. Now, to increase the surface area what we can do I can try to do the reaction in presence of some solids. Now, if suppose there is two fluid which are doing the reaction say gas and liquid or say liquid and liquid in the same state and they are not multi phase if they are going trying to do the reaction the reaction will take place only at the interface if they are mixed if they are not mixed they are at the interface if they are mixed then may be in the bulk, but still the surface area will be very low. Now, how can I increase the surface area if I make a solid if I suspend some of the solids there and let allow the reaction to happen on the surface of the solids then what will happen the surface area will increase drastically because now I have a small fine particles on which the reaction is taking place. Then the rate of reaction will be actually I can enhance by enhancing the mass transfer. So, that is the region that what we want we want to have a uh, increase the rate of reaction or we want to increase the production rate. So, we want to increase the surface area and therefore, generally we use solid as a catalyst to enhance the reaction surface area as well as the selectivity as we know that most of the, uh, the reactions also produce the byproducts to minimize the byproducts production or increase the selectivity of the uh, desired product we use some catalyst and most of these catalysts are actually in the solids form to increase the life of the catalyst as well as to increase the surface area to reduce the mass transfer limitations. So, this is the basics that why the multi phase flows are becoming the heart of any industry and is the need of the day to maximize the rate of production. So, what we can do we can classify the multi phase flow in the different form as I have discussed some of this, but the major classification of the multi phase flow is actually can be divided in four part one is the gas liquid flows the gas liquid flows is like a simple example is bubble column or distillation column which I have discussed. Now, what do you mean by uh, when I mean by the gas liquid flow it means if the liquid say I can fill in a column in a batch which is not moving 
and I can sparse the gas from the bottom of the column. So, this is my gas and this is my liquid. Now, what will happen if I sparse the gas from the bottom of the column, the gas will form a bubble and why I am drawing the shape of this bubble in as a mushroom shape, there is a reason behind this and uh, you can go and see the Dankworth theory or surface renewal theory or uh, other theories which are available for the bubbles, you will see that there is a region of being um, forming this kind of uh, bubbles. So, what will happen? The bubbles will form. Now, these bubbles will actually do the mass transfer with the liquid and based on that if it is a reactor and we want a gas liquid reaction, the reaction will take place. If it is a contactor, some mass transfer will take place with from the gas to liquid or liquid to the gas. So, in that way, this is the typical flow is being used which is called bubble column and it is widely used in many industries for the contacting purpose as well as for the reaction. One of the very important reaction which is known as a fischer tropsch reaction is also occur in the bubble column. So, it is a very important reaction class where bu bubble and gas and liquid actually contact with each other and flows together or they actually do some reaction together or mass transfer. So, this is called gas liquid flow. Then there is another class which is called the gas solid flows. Now, this class is again very popular and widely used in most of the industries particularly in petroleum, bulk chemical, chemical, pharmaceutical industries because most of our, our catalyst are in the solid phase as I discussed and the cracking power process of the crude oil is actually take place in gas solid reactors. So, what happens in the gas solid depending on the type of the reactor there is a huge classification here on the gas solid flows. I am not going in that classification, but consider a simple case that of a pack bed that the solids are being packed in the reactor and gas is being passed through the bottom of the column. Gas is being passed through the bottom of the column. Now, if this there will be some interaction, some mass transfer or some reaction will take place and this can kind of flow is classified as a gas solid flows. Now, most of our adsorber are of this kind of a flow where the solids are being packed which is used as an adsorbent and the gases is being passed to purify that. So, suppose I have a mixture of hydrogen CO, CO2, I can pass uh, the gases through this kind of adsorbent which is very selective for a particular component. So, they may absorb the CO, CO2 and H2 depending on the adsorbent properties. So, this is the typical gas solid flows or we can also do that I can make the flow at a little bit, I can pass the gas at a little bit higher velocity and suspend the solids. This is called fluidized bed reactors and being again widely used in many industries mainly because of their better heat and mass transfer characteristics and why there is a better heat and mass transfer because the solids are suspended. So, your surface area has increased compared to the packed bed reactors. So, that is why these reactors for the reaction purpose is preferred because you have enhanced mass transfer and heat transfer, but this is also a classification of gas solid uh, multiphase flow reactors. There are certain things which is called pneumatic uh, transport which is being also used in many industry to transfer the solid from one place to another place. So, there is two ways you can use a belt conveyor or you can use the truck or any other transportation system to transfer the solid from one place to another place. But if you are using a belt conveyor, it is very costly. Transporting it through the vehicles within the industry, it is sometimes very difficult because of the space requirement. So, generally we use the pneumatic conveying where we use the air pressure to transfer the solid from one location to another location. So, that is also considered as a gas solid flows and widely used in many industries. Now, why I am emphasizing about this? Because I want to just give you an idea that what kind of applications we are going to target and depending on the application what are the parameters we will be want to study. So, those things we will discuss later on, but let us first discuss about the classification of the multiphase flow. Then comes to the liquid solid flows, just like a packed uh, bed and fluidized bed reactor, I can say that the similar condition where the solid is being packed with the uh, and instead of the gas liquid is being passed through the bottom of the column or liquid is being used to fluidize the solid and this is also used in many industries particularly the sedimentation industries, slurry transport industries, mining industries where we have uh, we mine the ores and we want to separate the useful ore uh, from the uh, non useful ores or unused ores. So, we use the all those separation process uh, by using the liquid solid flows. So, that is also a class 
and then the another class is where all the three phases are flowing together gas liquid and solids. So, this is called slurry column or three phase fluidized bed reactors where all the three uh, phases are flowing together. The application of these kind of reactors is also very huge and again I will go to the fissure troughs. Now, with the development of the new catalyst the fissure troughs reactions are actually is being done in the slurry bed in the slurry uh, bubble column in which the solids are being used as a catalyst gases phase is being used and uh, is as a product and uh, gas phase is used as a reactant and liquid is as a product. So, that is called fissotrops reaction and which is typically used now in a three phase flow. So, this is the classification of multiphase flow reactors. Now, moving to the next what I would like to discuss is that once we are saying about the multiphase reactors and I am trying to give that what are those reactors or different type of the reactors the important parameter that why we want to study about this course and what we want to study and what is the critical need of this. So, mainly as I have discussed that if you want to understand about any reactor or any contactors or any flow through system you need to measure something. Now, what are the measurements needed particularly in terms of the multiphase flow reactors. So, as of single phase flow I want to definitely understand that what is my flow rate of different fluids. Now, I am telling it fluids, but I will say that different phases. So, it means what is my flow rates of either gas, liquid or solids if they are flowing together or if only one phase is flowing then also I want to understand that what is the flow rate. So, I want to definitely measure this quantity to understand that what is the flow rate requirement. So, that as of the basic uh, single phase flow I can calculate the Reynolds number if needed. Now, what is the issue in that one can always say that if you want to measure the flow rate you always have uh, some, some measurement devices which is used in the single phase flow like rotameter, venturi meter or RFS meter or pitot tube or any other meters mass flow meters to measure the flow rate. So, what is the problem? Now, the problem here is that how uh, this sometimes this phases are not separated they are exactly mixed. So, like if I talk about the crude oil then the crude oil once we are exploring the crude oil from the well or from the reservoir then what happened to explore those crude oil we actually inject steam or water to pulse the oil up. Now, during that injection some of the water is mixed with the oil and whatever we get is actually not only the oil, but a mixture of oil and water and that makes the measurement of those things is this thing is very difficult because whatever the understanding of venturi meter or phase meter or rotor meter we have is for single phase flow which is based on either the pressure drop or on the some calibration method for the case of rotor meter. So, all those things is based on the single phase, but now I already have a fluid which is in the multi phase. Now, uh, if one good parameter in this case is that if I able to maintain a steady state then this parameter actually is not a function of time. So, though if the, the phases are already mixed then it is difficult to measure the flow rates and we will try to discuss that if the phases are already mixed how to measure the flow rate of the fluids. But if they are suppose for a very simple case if I assume that there is a pipeline in which I am injecting oil separately water separately and if these are not mixed already they are the pure species when I am injecting into the reactor or into the pipeline then yes measurement can be done and at a steady state condition they will not be the function of time too. So, then it will be easier, but in case if they are already mixed it will be little bit difficult to understand the how to measure the uh, flow and that case we will try to discuss during the course. Then the second thing is volume of the reactor. Now, this is interesting because one can always find that say that why the volume of the reactor can be a parameter which I need to measure. So, I can always fabricate a reactor if I am fabricating a reactor I already know the volume of the reactor, but the most of the time the problem is it is true actually for many of the cases, but most of the time the problem is that suppose a case of fluidized bed in which there is solids which are actually suspended in the fluid they are not going out let us assume they are not going out they are just suspended in the fluid. So, what happened because of the air velocity some of the solids actually try to go up. So, if I make the reactor volume up to this label till the label solids are suspended then what will happen because of some fluctuations local fluctuations in the flow conditions 
and why that local fluctuation will take place we will discuss later on, but let us assume there are some local fluctuations. Then what will happen the label of this bed or label of these things can change and because of that the moment the label will change and if I make the reactor up to the same size as the solids are suspended this particles will go outside. So, what will happen I will lose my solids and if I will lose my solids if suppose they are catalyst I will lose the amount of the solids or weight of the solids. So, what will happen my conversion or the rate of reaction will change. So, to minimize that losses what we do we add some extra length here. So, that I can make sure that even if there is some local fluctuations the solids will not go outside of my reactor. But though this solves a problem, it this also create adding this extra length solves the problem, but it also create the problem. Now, how it create the problem? Now, I have added the extra length, I have solved the problem that my particle will not go outside of the system and my weight of the catalyst will remain intact or remain same, but I missed the information about the size of the reactor that what is the reactor size. So, can I take this reactor size the complete size? The answer is no because my reaction or my mass transfer is going on only in this volume. So, I need to find it out what is this volume. So, that is also a challenging for multiphase flow reactors. Now, thereafter it comes to the volume fraction. Now, this is uh, the main thing which we are going to discuss mainly in this course that how to measure the volume fraction. So, that is again a problem. Now, once I say volume fraction, it can be of dispersed phase, though I have written about the dispersed phase, but it can be the volume fraction of the continuous phase too. I have written only dispersed phase, assuming that they are two phases only, and if I know the volume fraction of the one phase, I will be knowing the volume fraction of the other phase also, because the overall mass continuity will be there. So, epsilon 1 means volume fraction of the phase 1 plus volume fraction of phase 2 should be equal to 1. So, if I know the volume fraction of phase 1, I can calculate the volume fraction of the phase 2. Now, there is a problem in that. So, what is volume fraction I will discuss later on. I am just trying to introduce the course. So, bear with me I will introduce this volume fraction later on, but what is the problem in measuring the volume fraction. So, it means suppose there is a gas and there is a liquid inside the pipeline. I want to understand how much fraction of is of the gas is present inside and how much fraction of the liquid is present inside. Now, why this is a problem? Now, I do not I want a global value for sure that also I want to calculate even calculating that is a problem, but I also want a local variable. It means how these phases are distributed inside. Now, why this distribution is important because as I said that if suppose I have a two phase flow reaction which is the liquid is reacting with the gas, the reaction will occur only at those locations where the gas is present. If the gas itself is not present there, there is no chance of any reaction. So, therefore, for a better design operation and scale up it is important to understand that how this gas phase is distributed inside. To do that what I need I need a functional spatial distribution of the phases. Okay. So, I need that how these phases are spatially distributed inside. Second is this phases are changing with the time is this distribution itself is changing with the time if yes, then how this distribution is changing with the time. And even if I maintain a steady state flow condition at the inlet, it is being observed that these phases, the spatial distribution of these phases locally keep on changing and that makes my, my life even more complicated. So, it means what I need temporal resolution, I need a spatial resolution in my technique. Temporal resolution means my technique should be very fast, it should capture it all the possible instances, all the possible changes with the time. A spatial resolution means even at a small distance if I move from say center to a very close distance to the center say 2 mm, 4 mm, 5 mm, I should able to understand how my fractions are changing. So, that is going to be very, very critical and we are going to see that how to do that and which are the techniques which are capable of doing this or is there is any technique which can do both. So, we will discuss all those things, but that is the reason that we are going to follow the volume fraction because this is a very critical quantity and the mass transfer rate or the reaction rate or extent of the mass transfer or extent of the reaction is going to depend that how these phases are distributed, they are interacting, how their distribution is changing with the location and with the time. So, that is what is the one of the critical parameter we want to find it out and the problem I have already discussed that even at a steady state condition they are a function of time locally 
and they definitely change with the space. Now, again I want to measure the another quantity is called mean velocity of the phases. So, whether it is a gas, liquid or solid, I want to understand the mean velocity. Now, once I say the mean velocity, it can be the time average mean velocity, it can be ensembled average mean velocity. We will discuss about these two mean velocities. I hope some of you might have idea about that, but still I will try to introduce this in later on this uh, course. So, what happened that mean velocity, because as I said that it is a mean velocity and if I am talking about time average mean velocity, definitely it is not going to be the function of time at a steady state condition. So, once it the steady state will achieve, it will not be the function of time. So, it will not be a function of time, but still it will be a spatial distribution location. So, even if it is a ensembled average or time average, it will be the function of location. Now, why it will be the function of location, the mean velocity? Let us discuss or let us try to understand. So, suppose I have a column and I will take again a case of the gas liquid system, where the liquid is in the batch, the most simplest case and I am injecting a, ga a gas from the bottom. Let us assume I am injecting a single bubble. Okay. So, I am injecting a single bubble and then or 1 1 bubble after a periodic interval. So, suppose if the single bubble I am injecting what will happen along this bubble the liquid will move up either on the top of the bubble or on because of the wake formation of the back of the bubble it will move up and with the time what will happen the bubbles will move upward. Now, again if I inject the second bubble after some time is the same profile will follow. So, what will happen liquid at the center will actually move up in the time average sense as well as in the ensembled average sense, but liquid near the wall will actually move down because gases will erupt from the, the top and go to the atmosphere, but liquid cannot pass through the column. So, they have no other option the liquid element which is moving up they have to come down towards the wall to fill the volumes. So, because of that I will see a proper flow pattern in which liquid will be moving up from the top going down from the bottom and in between somewhere the velocity may be 0. So, it means what even in the steady state condition even at a time average condition I am getting this picture, but it is changing with the location. So, I need to measure the mean velocity at a steady state condition it may not be the function of it will not be the function of uh, time but still it will be the function of a spatial location. So, I need to measure the mean velocity first and then I need to see that how the mean velocity is changing with the location. So, that put an extra challenge. Now, another parameter which I need to do just like the volume fraction is the local velocity of the phases. Now, this is very again very critical and important. Now, why it is important because we know that for most of the fast reactions the kinetics of the reaction actually depends on the local hydrodynamics compared to the global hydrodynamics or time average hydrodynamics. Now, what does it mean that it means that I need I should have a global information a mean velocity information, but I should also have a information about the local velocity. Okay. Now, how to find the local velocity information and whether it is a function of time or space if this is a local velocity I am talking then definitely it is going to be the function of time. Because suppose I discuss the same case in which liquid was filled in the column and a bubble was injected. So, what will happen with time this bubble will move up. So, if I see the velocity at this location say what will happen initially the velocity here was 0, but when the here the velocity was 0, but when the bubble will reach here the well you will see some velocity. Okay. So, because of that so, as I was discussing that the local velocity of the phases is important and why it is important that as we already know that in our reaction engineering that once the reaction is very fast then the local hydrodynamics actually plays more important role compared to the global hydrodynamics. So, it means if suppose uh, my fluid is flowing inside if my bubble is flowing inside of the same example that liquid is filled and I am passing the gas from the bottom of the column in form of a, if they, it will form a bubble, then what will happen if I see in the time average sense then initially at time t equal to 0 at the top the velocity of the liquid will be 0, because there will be no movement or very small movement will be there as the bubble is moving from the bottom of the column. Now, once the time passes the bubble will move up and then what will happen the velocity at the bottom will actually goes to 0, there will be no bubble here left. So, there will be no bubble. So, bubble is now here, the liquid is still at the bottom. 
So, what will happen now? The velocity of the liquid here is very low okay, and the velocity at the middle section will be higher. After some times, the bubble will reach till the top of the column and at that condition, the what will happen? The velocity of the gases or liquid will be very low near the, bot near the bottom of the column and it will be higher near the top. So, what is going to happen? The local phase velocity is again going to be the function of time as well as the space. So, space why it will be the function of space the region becomes same that the bubble is moving only at the center of the column. So, liquid will move up at the center down near the ball. So, it means even the local velocity of the fluid will change with the space and because the bubble is moving with the time up the velocity of the fluid local velocity of the fluid will also change with the time. So, that makes this column this local velocity is a function of both time and space and again it makes the problem more complicated and we will discuss some of the techniques for the velocity measurement both through invasive and non-invasive methods and we will try to see that which technique can give me ideally a very good spatial as well as temporal resolution. So, the technique which we provide both can provide both will be the ideal technique to use in the multiphase flow reactors if I want to understand the reactor in detail even at the local scale. Then comes the dispersion and mixing behavior of the phases. Now, from your undergraduate studies, you might have been knowing that the one of the important parameter to analyze the reactor is mean residence time or residence time distribution. We also called it RTD. Now, this is a quantity which is very important and can be easily calculated or relatively easily calculated I will say not easily calculated and gives the global picture about the behavior and that is why this is very popular in many industries people do the RTD studies to do the troubleshooting as well as to understand the design or uh, behavior of the column or reactor. Now, what happened in the single phase flow how we perform the RTD studies we inject some of the tracer a mass tracer which can change either the pH or any quantity in the flow and we measure the concentration of that mass tracer at the outlet. Now, depending upon whether what type of the reactor it is behaving I will get a some concentration versus time diagram of that mass tracer and based on that uh, this concentration versus time graph or diagram I can predict the behavior of this reactor and I can calculate the dispersion number for which I can calculate the mixing. So, I can define the mixing. Now, this is very straightforward or is relatively easier in single phase flow, but once it comes to multi phase flow this becomes a problem. The first problem is the tagging the individual phase itself is a problem. Now, suppose I have a gas liquid again same reaction and I want to find it out the residence time of the gases. So, what I need to do? I need to find a tracer which can go inside the bubble and then I can see that how these bubbles are moving. So, I will inject that tracer in air, but that tracer should able to go inside the bubble and I should then able to ca uh, calculate their concentration in form of the bubble at the exit because once they will go at the exit they will disperse. So, I should able to find the concentration of the bubble. So, doing that tagging a special phase itself is a problem. Other than that the many things which we use in the basic RTD the first thing which we use we cannot calculate in the multi phase. Now, the first thing which we use in the basic RTD is called mean residence time which can be which is calculated by V upon Q where V is the volume of the reactor or the column and Q is the flow rate. Now, in multi phase flow actually I cannot calculate this T bar. So, in single phase flow the good thing is if I know the volume of the reactor, if I know the column dimensions, I know the volume of the reactor. I can measure the flow rate easily by using any of the measurement devices like venturi meter, orifice meter or rota meter. So, ideally I can calculate the T mean and then whatever the graph I have said I can calculate that whether the T mean of this graph and this critical value is matching or not. If it is not matching there are certain rules through which I can find it out what, whether there is a recirculation, whether there is some dead zone or something whatever is happening inside. So, I can do that by calculating the T mean from this place to the ideal T mean. The problem with the multi phase flow I cannot calculate it. Now, why we cannot calculate it? The first thing I have already told you that volume of reactor itself is a questionable that what should be the volume of the reactor as the height of the liquid may change depending upon the velocity of the gases in this case or height of the solids may change depending on the velocity of the gas or liquid for which the column is being used. 
So, I will not able to calculate the exact volume that is the first problem. Second problem is with the flow rate. Now, why we have used the flow rate which is outside assuming that the velocity inside will remain same because the superficial velocity the column is empty. Now, in this case the one phase is going to disperse inside. So, actually you cannot take an empty column area. The area will be actually whatever the area is being occupied by that phase. Now, that is going to change and that may change with the time with the location. So, that makes the problem more complicated to analyze the RTD curve. Still the RTD is a very popular technique and many people are using and we will also try to discuss that how to perform RTD in multiphase flows and how I will also try to discuss some of the case studies. So, this is the another an issue and this again I told you that it is going to be the function of time and space and then there are two derived quantity which are mass transfer coefficient and heat transfer coefficient. Ideally, I need to measure all this if I want to design a reactor so that I can find it out what is the limitation or what is the resistance offered because of the mass transfer and resistance offered uh, due to the heat transfer so that I can predict the temperature profile and temp concentration profile inside the reactor. So, these are the quantities which ideally we want to measure and we will try in this course to focus mainly on these three quantities. Okay. And we will briefly discuss about this and once we will discuss 4, we will already come to know about the flow rates measurement that how to do that. So, that is the thing which we are going to cover in this course, why it is important, what are the problem and how to encounter that we will see it later on, but I have tried to keep till now a basics that how to measure these things what are the problems, whether it is going to be the function of time or not, whether it is going to be the space or not and it means ideally what I want as a technique. So, I will say my wish list should be high temporal resolution and high spatial resolution. So, what I want from all this is high temporal resolution and high spatial resolution. It means what? I want my technique to be very fast so that it can see all the changes inside. So, it be very accurate with the space. It means the scale should be as low as possible so that I can see that with the location how the things are moving. So, this is the two parameters which we are going to discuss when I will discussing the techniques. Now, what we are going to see in the scope of measurement, I said that the parameters which we want to measure, but one of the most uh, things which we are going to say is that the pressure measurements. So, we are going to discuss about the pressure measurements as we all know that if I am talking about the flow, the flow always occurs because of the delta p. So, if I want to do a flow in multiphase condition also if the two fluid are flowing still the delta p requirement is there. So, I would like to calculate that how to measure the delta p in a multiphase flow reactors in single phase it is easy because you can just use a manometer, but in multiphase flow this is difficult because suppose if I am using a pipeline, how to suppose this is a condition in which the flow is separated, water is down, oil is up and if I am measuring the flow here in this line with the manometer, the delta p, how, what whether I will able to see the complete effects. Okay. So, that is the question we need to answer and more problem comes once the flow is dispersed. So, suppose if the oil is dispersed in the water, I am seeing the bubbles or droplets sorry of the oils and then it is passing through the water is there. So, what will happen whenever uh, they wherever there is uh, oil you will see a fluctuations. So, it will pass through you will keep on seeing the fluctuations in your manometer reading. So, the moment the oil will come you will see some fluctuations. So, getting a steady state value or constant reading of delta h in the manometer is very difficult. Similar problem will comes even if you use a pressure gauge. So, how to calculate the delta p or how to measure the delta p and then how to analyze that delta data itself is a issue in multiphase flow reactor and we will try to discuss that in the pressure measurements. Then we will do the velocity measurement I have already discussed that what we want. We want to measure local velocity as well as the mean velocity. Once I say mean velocity, I am interested in both time average velocity as well as ensembled average velocity and we want to measure actually all three. 
then we want to measure the mixing characteristics as I said that if I measure the RTD or if I measure the volume fraction as well as the velocity, I can ideally measure the mixing characteristics. So, I would like to measure the mixing characteristics, dispersion number, residence time distribution, all these things we want to measure and we will try to see that. Then we want to measure not only the mean velocity or the local velocity, we also want to measure the moments of that. Now, what does I mean by moments? So, I just do not want to measure the mean velocity, I will also like to measure the fluctuation velocity. So, I will say it as the first order moment of the velocity. I would also like to measure the RMS velocities, I would also like to measure diffusion coefficient from the RMS velocity. I would also like to do some time series analysis of the velocity data. So, to find some chaos analysis. So, we will see that can we do that, can we do all these things, because more the detailed information we have, better the understanding we will able to generate. Then I would like to measure the volume fraction, as we have already discussed that how the phases are being distributed and as I said I would like to measure the time average picture, the spatial picture and temporal result picture. So, I want to see all these three, how these quantities are varying in the time average sense, in the spatial sense and in the temporal sense. So, all these things we would like to see in the scope of measurement and we will try to discuss all these methods, all these measurement method, uh, this, uh, methods, the techniques which can measure all these parameters. So, we will discuss some of the techniques to measure the pressure, we will discuss some of the technique invasive and non-invasive to measure the velocity and we will discuss some of the technique to measure the volume fractions. So, now, before going to the main course starting the uh, measurement techniques, I would like to briefly introduce about some of the definitions or some of the numbers or quantity which we are going to use widely in the course. Uh, I would highly recommend that you should do some multiphase courses and if you have done the multiphase courses, maybe these things are repeated and you might have seen these numbers or these values, but still to make everyone on the same platform, I am going to uh, tell the same thing. The first thing in the multiphase flow we define is number density. Now, what does the number density means? The number of particle droplet or bubbles per unit volume. So, now I have a reactor and as I said that there are two phases. So, suppose the dispersed phase is suppose bubble in a liquid gas liquid system. Again, I am taking the same example and suppose I am sparging the gas from the bottom. What will happen? I will see some bubbles. So, number density is that what is the number of your droplet or your particle in case this case what is the number of bubbles per unit volume that is called the number density. Okay. So, this is one of the very important parameters which we need to understand that what is the uh, fractions have, uh, the, the density available of the phage number density. Then the volume fraction which we I was using since long that this is the volume fraction measurement we want to do. Now, I would like to formally introduce the volume fraction. So, what does volume fraction means? Volume fraction means the volume of dispersed phase divided by the total volume. So, again I will go to the same. So, if I know the number density of the phages which is say in the same system gas liquid. If I know the number density, if I know the volume of each particle, I will know the total volume of the dispersed phage. Okay. So, either if I know the say number density of the particle and volume of the each bubble, then if I multiply them, then I will find the total volume fraction volume uh, of the dispersed phase to the volume of the reactor and volume of the reactor is this till what the liquid is being filled, the height after the bubble injection. So, that is the volume of the reactor. So, if I know this the ratio of these two volume or I can say the dispersed phase volume to the total volume is called volume fraction it means that much fraction out of the total volume is being filled by the gas. So, if I say that the volume fraction say this is equal to 0 0.2, it means 20 percent of my total volume is being filled by the gases. Similarly, for the continuous phase I can say the volume of the continuous phase divided by the total volume, it will be the volume of V c is the volume of the continuous phase, total volume of the reactor is V. So, if I say that the same example if the 20 percent is my dispersed phase volume if for the two phase flow, I am writing this two phase flow that is important. I can say that epsilon d plus epsilon c will be equal to 1. So, if I know that the volume of dispersed phase is 0 0.2. I can say that this plus epsilon c is going to be 1, it means epsilon c is going to be 0 0.8. So, 
So, if I know the volume fraction of one phase for the two phase flow system, I can easily calculate the volume fraction of the second phase. Now, for three phase flow, this becomes little bit typical because if the three phase flow is there, there will be three phases. So, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, this 3 will be equal to 1. It means, if the flow is three phase, your problem is more complicated. In two phase flow, you just need to measure the one volume fraction. If you measure one volume fraction, your job is done. In two phase, three phase flow, you have to measure at least two fractions. If you measure the two fractions, then only you will be able to find the fraction of the third and then only you will be able to see that if this measurement is correct. So, in that way the three phase fixed systems is becomes little bit more complicated. So, that is the region, but the volume fraction definition itself is defined as the volume of the phase divided by the total volume of the reactor. So, that is called or the total volume not the reactor total volume okay, of both the phases. So, that is called the volume fraction. Now, Another definition, I hope this everyone knows, but still for the sake of uh, again bringing everyone on the same page, we introduce the term superficial velocity. You all might be knowing superficial velocity is nothing but the volumetric flow rate divided by the cross, cross section area of the empty column. Now, for the single phase flow, it is very simple that the say a liquid is passing through a column or in a pipeline then what we say that if I know the volumetric flow rate which I can measure through pitot tube, I can measure through venturi, I can measure through orifice or rotameter, I know the area of the column, if I know the diameter, I know the area of this pipe. So, area of this pipe will be pi by 4 d square. So, I can do the q by a, I will find it out the superficial velocities. Okay. So, the superficial velocity is the concept is being widely used in uh, industries, in chemical industries, mechanical, many people have used this in the engineering to find that what is the velocities. Now, once we will see in the multi phase flow, we will use the superficial velocity of the continuous phase and discourse phase. So, I say that if suppose the case where oil and water is being fed separately, both the phase are pure assuming. So, I can measure the what oil flow rate and I can also measure the water flow rate by using the techniques which I have already said pitot tube, uh, orifice meter, venturi meter, or rotameter. Then if I divide individually, individually by area of the, rear, uh, the column or area of the pipe, I can find the superficial velocity of the water or superficial velocity of the oil. So, in this case suppose if I want to find superficial velocity of oil, that will be Q of oil divided by pi by 4 d square. So, now I am not worried that how the oil is whether dispersed or not, how much fraction is co being covered by oil or how much fraction is being covered by the water, I am not worried about that. I am defining that this is the my oil flow rate, let us assume only oil is flowing inside the pipe and based on that I will define the superficial velocity. So, in the term of during the course once I say that superficial velocity of this phase, it means only that we are assuming only that phase is flowing inside the column or reactor. Similarly, u of water will be nothing but equal to q of water and divided by pi by 4 d square. Again, I am telling you that this d and this d is actually equal. It means you are using the diameter of the column, you are not worried about that whether how much fractions is being covered. So, that is called superficial velocity. Now, once the superficial velocity concept is there, we have to now define a term which is called phase velocity. The phase velocity means the velocity of that phase inside the column. So, ideally superficial velocity is really superficial, they never exist actually inside. Okay. But the phase velocity can be calculated if I know the superficial velocity and how the phase velocity can be calculated. So, the phase velocity will be nothing but the superficial velocity divided by the epsilon g. It means what I am saying that I have calculated the say for the same condition oil. Okay. If I know the superficial velocity of the oil, if I know the epsilon of oil, it means the fraction of the pipeline which is being covered by the oil then I can find it at oil phase velocity inside the pipeline. Okay. And the concept remains same, if you go with the concept, what I will say the superficial velocity this is nothing but q of oil upon area. 
okay and this area is if multiplied by epsilon i will say that this is the area cross sectional area which is being covered with the oil so now i am going with the actual area of which is being covered with the oil so then if i calculate the velocity i will get the phase velocity so it means if i need the phase velocity i need fraction that what is the fraction of that okay so that is the another term which we are going to use widely that is called phase velocity which is being defined as superficial velocity divided by the fraction that phase has been covered of volume fraction of that phase now i was introducing about the ensembled average velocity and time average velocity so what is ensembled average velocity so ensembled average velocity is the velocity at a particular location if i see i don't think about the time i just think about that location how many times the particle is coming so the ensembled average means suppose if i have a small section a fluid is moving here several times so there are several instances the fluid are moving so for all instances there is say these are the instances and for each instance fluid has certain velocity so once i say ensembled average velocity what i will do say i have a 50 instances for which the fluid comes within that element i will and each 50 instances the fluid has certain velocity i will add all those velocities say v1 plus v2 plus v3 and so on to v50 and then divided by the 50 that is called the ensembled average velocity and why i write ijk ijk are the indices which is showing that this is for a particular location so this will be the superficial velocity at a particular location it is called ensembled average velocity in which i am using actually in a number density i am talking about the number of instances it came to that place and each instances once it came to that place of when whenever we measure the velocities or whenever the particle come or that uh, tracer come then what was the velocity of that fit that tracer at that location if i take the long time uh, ensembled average or for if i do the experiment for the longer time several time the particle of this fluid will come at a particular location we can measure the velocity there if i take the ensembled average that velocity is called ensembled average velocity the second term is called time average velocity now this is the notion of the velocity is continuous so it means if suppose i inject some tracer inside a flow where the fluid is moving what will happen the tracer will also move with the time if i each time if suppose i measure the velocity each time if i measure the velocity say v1 v2 v3 which is changing with the time and if i take the summation of that and divide it by the total time i will get the time average velocity it means suppose a particle is moving with the time what you are doing you are measuring the time at a certain intervals and then you are just doing the 1 upon t 0 to t some books follow minus t to t then it will be 1 upon 2 t this will be v t t t so this is called time average velocity so what we are interested in we are interested in both ensembled average velocity as well as the time average velocities and we'll see that how to measure both the quantities later on then we are also interested in the autocorrelation and cross correlation and some of you might be knowing this but still for the sake of everyone and to make everyone in the same platform i will try to repeat it now the autocorrelation is what autocorrelation is suppose i have a time series so suppose some tracer is moving or a fluid is moving inside and i have a time series say this is how volume velocity let's say velocity is changing with the time it can be even the volume fraction it can be any quantity say pressure how it is changing with the time so is there is any correlation in the time series or in the uh, truss suppose the tracer movement is there is any tr correlation in the tracer movement with the time so to find that we find the autocorrelation function which says that you to the time interval is from minus t to t or you can say 0 to t x t that function to it is correlated with the function at a certain interval t plus tau where tau is the interval so if the autocorrelation function is equal to 1 it means the flow is perfectly correlated and if this is zero it's not correlated at all and if it is between zero to one we can say that extent till which it is being correlated so this is widely used to analyze the time series to do the time series analysis and to understand about the system 
that whether the system is repeating himself or not, whether it is a periodic or not and we will discuss try to cover some of these points uh, during the course of our discussion of measurement techniques and the post processing of the measurement techniques. Now, there is another term which is cross correlation which is used in some of the techniques to actually get the data or to get the information. What the cross correlation technique says, suppose I have a two time series analysis, one is for function uh, f and one is for variable g. So, one is uh, variable f, one is variable g or I will say that the same variable, but two different time series or two different particle time series, if there is any correlation between them. Okay. So, that is called cross correlation. So, this is the uh, time series of the first correlation, first uh, parameter or first series and is it correlated with the second series. So, what does it mean? Suppose, if I inject say two particles in a flow. Now, these two particles are flowing together. Okay. Now, each particle suppose if I measure the velocity of each particle, I will see some term the time series analysis. So, this is say f and this is g for the second particle also I will see the time series that how the velocity is changing with the time. So, can I find that these two particle motions are correlated if the value is equal to 1 again the motions are correlated if the value is equal to 0 then motions are not correlated in between they are partially correlated. So, these information is needed to analyze the data and we will see in the measurement techniques that we will calculate this either to do the post processing to get some more information or we will use these information to reconstruct or to get the uh, parameters from the measurement techniques. Okay. The same cross correlation, then this is a term which we are also going to use widely which is called ergodicity. Now, what is ergodicity? When the time average and ensemble average of this property of any property is equal that is called the ergodic. It means if I am talking about the velocity then the v i j k which is ensemble average velocity if once it becomes equal to the time average velocity the system is called ergodic in nature. Now, what does it mean and this is very important in the measurement techniques particularly. So, suppose there is a this uh, column in which a particle is being flowing. So, if so if many particles are being flowing or say fluid is flowing forget about the particle even let us make it single single phase flow there is no two phase flow. So, if suppose there is a fluid is flowing and I want to track the motion of the fluid. So, for that what I can do I can inject some of the neutrally buoyant particle and all our streamline potential flow all those fundamentals is being developed with the tracking of the particle path line streamline and all. And uh, if you revise your undergraduate uh, fluid magnets courses you will see that. So, what I can do I can either track the motion of this fluid with a single particle where the single particle is moving and I can keep on tracking putting the repeating the same particle. So, it means the single particle I have left once the single particle will go up once it went on the top I actually collected the particle again I have re-injected it again I have re-injected it again I have re-injected it. So, either I track the motion of a single particle for n number of time or n number of the particle together all this n number of particle together and I track the motion of all this n number of particle that how they are moving. So, in one case I will get the ensembled average, one case I will get only the time average I will get that the motion of all the particles together. If both are giving me the same thing that is called ergodicity okay. and we will use the ergodicity concept uh, very commonly particularly in the measurement techniques mainly once we will talk about uh, velocity measurement technique. So, this is called ergodicity. So, with this the introduction on multiphase flow, basic multiphase flow and the definitions or terminology which is needed to understand multiphase flow and multiphase flow reactors and measurement techniques I have covered. Now, next I will start about the measurement techniques and we will classify the measurement techniques as I discussed in two part one is invasive and one is non-invasive.